Oh, and he's new to the place. Guten Morgen. Wie geht es Ihnen? Good morning. How are you? It's really a pleasure to be here, and I hope that what I have to share will be of some significance for you. <clears throat> As the slide shows, <clears throat> I was born in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, San Juan, on a uh, what my dad used to call a truck farm. We had uh, fruit and vegetable, primarily. Uh, most of the vegetables that you buy in the grocery store today are, is what we grew on our farm. And there was absolutely nothing in that lifestyle that prepared me for what was going to happen later in life. When I was 13, my father contracted cancer and, and died. And uh, my mother absolutely just, just went to pieces. Dad had been the love of her life since she was 14 years of age. And when he passed on, then uh, her life was destroyed. So things looked pretty bleak for a while for my sister and I until uh, my mother's younger sister and her husband stepped in. Now, my uncle was a career military soldier who had gone all the way through World War II, through North Africa, through the combat there into, into Italy, and then into Europe, and finally into Germany. And uh, I didn't know it, but at the, during, as he was preparing to go to war, he and my dad had made an agreement that if anything happened to my uncle, that my dad would take care of my aunt for as long as she needed to be cared for. Well, as it turned out, uh, my dad was the one who died, not my uncle. And uh, so when he came home and he found my mother in the shape that she was in, uh, he literally took us in. And that's how I became an army brat. And on the, in the middle of August, 1946, we set sail on the USS Gothels, which had been a military troop ship. And the only modification that they had made for dependents was to take out two of the, of the six bunks that normally uh, uh, served to transport GIs uh, overseas. And uh, I was in a room of about 60 uh, young men. The The... Mothers and the girls were on one side of the ship, and all of the boys and young men were on, on the other side, and we had a cabin of our own. And I was one of the older boys in the cabin at that time. Um, as a result, I slept on the top bunk. I was bigger than the rest of them, so I could get up there. We, uh, we docked in Bremerhaven, the primary port into Germany, on August the 27th, I remember that because it's my mother's birthday, 1946. Uh, came in that evening and then docked the next morning and early on we got onto a train and traveled to the community of Bamberg, down here. This is in uh, Bavaria, uh, the, in the American uh, zone of occupation. As you know, I think you've been studying uh, the military uh, forces that fought Germany were so angry uh, about the war that they decided that this is never going to happen again. And they, div they divided Germany up into four zones. The, uh, well, the Russian, British, French, and the American. This is the... Uh, uh, front page of the album of our, my second year of high school in Germany. And as you see, it, it shows, the, shows the zones. Now, there were two exceptions to these zones. And that was in Bremerhaven. There was an enclave up there uh, of Americans uh, to handle the port and entry place. And the other place was Berlin. 
and Berlin was occupied by all of the uh, uh, forces because it had been the capital. We had a high school in Bremerhaven. We had a high school in Berlin. We had one originally in uh, Erlangen and Frankfurt and one in Munich. The one that I attended in Erlangen later moved to Nuremberg. Germany was in chaos after World War II. Uh, this is a picture of Old Town Nuremberg shortly after the war was over. And all of the large cities experienced this kind of destruction. Bamberg, the town in which we lived, was, was much less destroyed because it was, it was not an industrial center, it was an agricultural center. It was like, and this is the housing in which we lived at that time. This is the Regnitz River that flows through uh, the center of Bamberg. As I say, Germany was in chaos, and uh, the recovery was very, very slow. Fortunately, there was a thing known as the Marshall Plan. Maybe you studied this in school. Um, it was originally designed to help Europe and the nations that had been occupied by Germany to recover. Uh, but fortunately, I think General Marshall was extremely brilliant. And this time, the, they included Germany in the recovery. And one of the things that they did was to clear the streets, put all this rubble up in the, on the side, uh, off of the sidewalk, and then hire people to clean the, the bricks and salvage as much of the material as they possibly could. So all over Germany, you saw people in, in, the, in the rubble collecting the bricks, and then they had uh, uh, others that were sitting aside that were cleaning them, taking off the mortar, clean, uh, brushing them clean, and stacking them neatly on the sidewalk. And then they later used this as a part of their reconstruction. And that was particularly true in the old towns uh, that they wanted to return to as close to the original shape as they were, had been prior to the war. And they succeeded quite admirably. Um, all American families, when they arrived in Germany, were expected to hire uh, German maids. This was a part of the recovery process. And the maid that we had in our, our house was, was Frida an elderly German lady who did cleaning, house cleaning, and, and cooking for us. And uh, after uh, many of our meals, if there were a lot left over, she would take those leftovers home with her and, and help feed her family. That's how desperate things were. And I think she was feeding two families, uh, of her, her husband and herself, as well as two children and their families. So it was not easy for any, any of them at that time. There was no money available. It was all done by barter system. I remember uh, that there was a little uh, fair came to town with rides, you know, Ferris wheel and, and the little cars that go uh, uh, merry-go-round and things of that, and that nature to Bamberg one, uh, during the summer that I was there. And I went to it, and I took three Hershey bars. I have spent the entire afternoon riding rides on, uh, after having given the operator three Hershey bars. It was a part of the barter system that was going on. Farms in Germany are a lot different than they are in the United States. You don't live on your farm in Germany. You live in a village. And uh, you, you, you go out, get up early in the morning, have your breakfast, and, and then you go out to your farm and till it, take care of it. It's quite a different arrangement. And at that time, there was no fuel available. So most of the uh, farming was done with oxen. And they had uh, uh, pulling uh, hay wagons and their plows and their harrows and things of that, that nature. It was a, uh, a new experience for me totally was to watch the, this, this kind of experience thing. Uh, 
<coughs> this is the actually the the first school that I attended uh, what was in in Erlangen, and the first building was a just a a home that had been occupied. This is a picture of the freshman freshman class right here, and that the freshman class met in the uh, dining room, and uh, the sophomore class was in the living room, and the juniors and seniors were upstairs in a conference room type place. The, uh, that was until thanks, Thanksgiving. When we came back from Thanksgiving break, we had been moved to the science building at the University of Erlangen. <coughs> And that's where we spent the rest of the year. I was in the science building there. This is a picture of the first dormitory that we had, which originally had been in a German enlisted man's barracks. And as you can see, the pot marks, those are rifle bullet uh, results uh, as the building had been attacked by our, our first forces. I understand that uh, on this Air Force base, they're, they're, they had captured one of the first jet airplanes that the German uh, military had, uh, had developed during the war. That's my roommate, Dickie Dugan. This is a house that we lived in in, Ber in Germany. This is, uh, and, and my room is, is on the third floor up there. This is the street. And it's Dietzenhofer Strasse. This picture was taken just prior to uh, the war. And as you see, there are trees there. And, uh, but when we were there, all of those trees were gone because they had been cut down for firewood. Uh, it was so cold. And after we left, trees were replanted. And today, that's what it looks like. After that first year in uh, uh, Erlangen, uh, we had uh, a, a rather short um, summer. Actually, we didn't start school in Erlangen until the 14th of October, because when I went over, we weren't sure we were going to have a school system at all. Uh, we thought possibly I would attend with the German uh, kids, uh, but they finally decided to develop a a uh, military uh, school system for American students, and, and I was a charter member of, the, the, of this particular school. I was there the first day it opened. Okay, then after summer break, we moved to this building, and this is in, in Nuremberg. Uh, originally, this was a girls' school. During the war, it was used as a hospital, and then after the war, it became our school. This is the front door. This is the military staff assigned to us to make sure that things were administered properly. That's me. Can you imagine that that's what I looked like 60 some odd years ago? Anyway, that's, that's, that's me. And these are my friends, Doug and Jack, Myra and Louis Raffi. Uh, we all lived in, in Bamberg. The, uh, First winter that we were in Germany, things were really difficult for the people. Um, my uncle was a man who always uh, explored um, the local communities wherever he was stationed to find uh, orphanages. And he discovered that Bamberg had three orphanages, two Catholic and one Protestant. And uh, he d and decided that things were so rough that we would try to have a Christmas party for the, uh, the, the children in the orphanages. And so we started writing home to all sorts of churches, uh, Red Cross, Salvation Army, whoever we could think of that might provide us with uh, things that we could use for children to to make a Christmas uh, for them. And as I, on the picture of our house, I was on the third floor. Well, there were three bedrooms up there, and two of those bedrooms became uh, storage 
for stuff that was coming in from all over the United States. Every family in Bamberg was doing the same thing, and we were getting things, and, and it was being stored at our house. About the time it came, just before Christmas, my uncle had uh, discovered a warehouse that had some uh, old German tintage in it uh, that had, uh, was beginning to rot because there was a leak in the, in the, in the roof of the building, and, and so the military was going to take it out and either burn it or bury it or d dispose of it in some fashion. He said, don't do that. Let me have it. I'll take care of it. And he gave that to the uh, directors of the three orphanages. And the nuns and the administrator of the Protestant uh, orphanage took that and somehow or another they found thread. And they made uh, clothing out of tintage. They, the, for the boys, they made lederhosen. Lederhosen normally is made of leather and it's short pants with suspenders uh, so that they since they didn't have that they used the the tintage and the canvas to to make the later hosen and then they decorated it with uh, uh, fancy uh, stitching and things of that nature on on the suspenders and for the girls they made skirts and with the suspenders and they did the same thing fancy stitching to decorate it and so each child at Christmas received either a pair of lederhosen or a skirt uh, as a part of their Christmas that year. And um, there were t about 10 of us in uh, American students in, in Bamberg at, that, at the time of that Christmas. And uh, we, we set up a table, a long table, and uh, with all of the things that we, we wanted to make sure each student got. And because they were so short on personal supplies, that's primarily what we, we made arrangements for. And each of us got a plastic sack, and then we had all of this material spread, uh, spread out. I was responsible for toothbrushes and toothpaste. And uh, we would start the plastic bag at one end and pass it down. I put in my toothbrush and toothpaste and then there was soap and a washcloth and shampoo and a towel and and other uh, other things that we thought that might be beneficial to each student uh, and things that they did not have at that time and made that into a, a, a part of their Christmas and then the, then all of the clothing was packaged according to size and was made available to the uh, um, to the directors of the orphanages to be passed out at Christmas. Then my uncle found a large uh, uh, building in town that had been vacated and decided that he would use it uh, to conduct a, a Christmas party. Now this was a beautiful building with uh, marble floors and marble staircase and uh, uh, it's really an incredible thing to see. Uh, and uh, set up a big Christmas tree, and then all of the American youth acted as Santa Claus's helpers, and they had Santa Claus come in, and we were responsible for big bags of popcorn to pass out to the kids. And uh, I happened to, I ended up with uh, serving the uh, the deaf children, and uh, they they absolutely swamped mobbed me for popcorn, and I remember backing up the stairs trying to keep them at, at bay and still pass out the popcorn. And the farther up, the more popcorn I spilled. And I don't know, that pop floor was covered with popcorn before that day was over. But I think they enjoyed the, the experience. And it was certainly, we tried our best to, to give them a halfway decent uh, Christmas on a day that otherwise would have been, been really bad. This is school life. It's pretty much like it is here, except that we all lived in dormitories. Since, and we rode trains to, to school. I would get on the train on Sunday uh, after the evening meal. Uh, we'd usually eat early on, on Sunday after evening. And then I would go down and get on the train. And it's about an hour and a half, two hour drive, a ride 
to, to school. And we lived in, in dormitories. And uh, this, is, this is a picture of me and one of the girls there. And we're on the back porch of the girls' dorm. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is our dining room, and of course, there she is again. And uh, uh, our our dining room was used for everything. Well, as you can see, here's the pep rally going on. We also had dances in there. Uh, uh, that was one of the ways that we welcomed new students in uh, was to have a dance to to bring them into and help them incorporate into the school system. One of the things about military families is that we're constantly moving. And so the turnover of students within the school system was great. And so we had to have some means in which to incorporate them back into the system and make friends in a, in a hurry. And this is one of, the, one of the things that we did was to use this. After the evening meal, we would usually go out in the hall and do the hokey pokey. If any of you know what the hokey pokey is, that was our favorite activity, you know, do the hokey pokey. This young lady, uh, that year, uh, the senior class had only four students, one boy and three girls. This, these are both seniors. Now, by then, she had another boyfriend, not me. <laughs> And this, this one is the one that invited me to escort her to the senior prom. The senior prom was held here. That is a castle. Let me tell you, there's nothing about South Texas that prepares you for castles. Absolutely nothing. They had the most beautiful ballroom that you ever saw. It's just fantastic. Nothing in South Texas prepares you for German waltz music as well by string quartets it's it's quite an experience you know uh, i'm having i'm experiencing major lifestyle changes by my life in germany i'm telling you but it, one of my favorite memories is the closing dance at the uh, at, at the end of the prom which was a strauss waltz and we're all lined up around around the ballroom the girls in their their gown and the boys in their suits, and we're, we're doing the, 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 the waltz. It's twirling around and around and around and around. And I can still visualize all of those, the beauty of the, of the, of the scene with the German orchestra playing for us. And uh, that's something that I'm, I'm grateful for, that stays with me at all times. So. We did have sports. The first year that we were there, we only had two basketball and baseball then afterwards then on our second year we added football um, I tried <laughs> I'm probably the worst athlete that you ever met but I tried so uh, and occasionally I studied <laughs> <laughs> anyway but the, the you know, and, and they tried to, to provide us with the same opportunities that are, that are here in the United States. And this is where we played football. I don't know if any of you have seen pictures, but this is, this is where they held all of the German youth rallies uh, during the war. This is where Hitler did a lot of his speeches up here and uh, had thousands and thousands of people uh, assembled out here to hear his rants, you know, about the, the future of, of Nazi Germany. But as you notice, this is clear up here. There used to be something up there, but it's gone now, and this is now called Soldier's Field, and this is our football team. Notice the, and notice the leather helmets. You know, we didn't have the, the, the protective gear that they wear today. Uh, this was still in the early stages of, of things. Oh, and also in basketball. You know, originally for the game of basketball, you had to jump center every time you made a shot. Our goal, I don't know if any of you knew that, but we did. That's how we played the game. Slow game. High scoring game, 20 points. <laughs> 
This is the way it looked before the war. This is our field. Some difference. Today, it's, it's almost totally uh, gone. It's just deteriorated and no one has maintained it. It's, it's not, it's kind of sad that it has, this has happened to the, such a glorious edifice as it was at one time. I was there when this happened. In early 1948, there were a lot of changes that were going on and there was a lot of tension between the Russians and the rest of the Allies. The uh, Western part uh, nations were trying to combine uh, the Western Germany and, and, it, and, and it did in fact become Western Germany uh, in, in 1948 and they had their first uh, chancellor uh, was appointed. But in the process, uh, Russia became very upset about that, that process that they sensed was going on. And so they did the blockade, Berlin blockade. Now, the day that that started, our basketball team was in Frankfurt to play a game. We played Frankfurt, and we spent the night in a hotel. The next morning, we were supposed to get up, have breakfast, and, and fly to Berlin to play the Berlin team. But the coach came in after breakfast and said, sorry, boys, the game's been canceled. And of course, why? He said, well, the blockade has... Uh, been initiated and they have decided to use all available planes to provide coal and fuel and food to the people of Berlin. And let me tell you, that was, I don't know how those guys did those flights. That day was horrible. It was cold. Ice was on everything. The, the power lines, the telephone lines, every tree branch was covered with at least an inch of ice. The fog was thick. You couldn't hardly see. Half a block was about all you could see. And those guys are flying in that weather. Uh, it, it amazes me today to think about the dedication of those guys. What you see here is, is one of the pictures of the plane coming in for a landing in Berlin. Notice that these, there are a lot of children here. Do any of you know why there are so many children there? American, American pilots started throwing candy out their window as they were coming in for a landing. It became, this became probably the most popular spot for the youth of Berlin. Uh, uh, the, the, during that time, and, and, and the Berlin airlift became known as the Candy Airlift by the German youth of, of Berlin. I thought that was great. <laughs> this is a more serious part of my visit, was to have the opportunity in our civics class to attend Dachau. Dachau was one of the concentration camps. Uh, before we went to Dachau, they showed us film that American GIs had taken at the liberation of these concentration camps. They showed us material that the news cameras had taken after it became known to the general public they, uh, one, one of the concentration camps, the American commander went out into the local village and gathered all of the German population and took them and forced them into a visit of the concentration camp and forced them to help bury the bodies because they were denying that such a thing was even possible. And this was to force them to acknowledge it. I visited the showers 
which were really gas chambers. I visited and saw the ovens where the bodies were cremated. I saw the, the holes that were dug to dispose of the bodies. Life changing. Man's inhumanity to man. This is part of the youth discussions that occurred between the German youth and the American youth. Were the trials legal? Were they right? Uh, the German youth contended that they were not appropriate because the, the people were just simply following orders. They were just doing what they were told. Whereas we contended that, you know, it may be ordered, but all of us have an obligation to each other. And none of us should be forced into destroying innocent people. And from that came what is known as the code of conduct. And it was, that was in effect then when I entered military service myself. A, con a code of conduct by which military personnel will operate. And part of that is, is that you do not obey an order which is contrary to you know, moral values. The killing of innocent people, civilians, children. You're not allowed to do that. And you can be prosecuted for it. And I think it's appropriate. This is the Nuremberg trial. This is the courtroom where the trials were held. That's me. We sat in the balcony and listened to the trials as they occurred. We had headphones and we could put them on. And then we heard, we could, by switching channels, you could hear the languages. There was one in, in just what was being presented. Whoever was speaking, you could get, hear what they were saying in the language that they were saying it in. One was in, all in English, all in Russian, all in French. So four different channels. And you could listen to what was going on at that time. This is the, uh, the Palace of Justice. Now, it had been in pretty bad shape after the war, so the Americans went in and refurbished it, fixed it up very nicely. This is the building of administration. This is where all of the records were retained. This is where all the uh, uh, evidence was gathered. This is where all the witnesses were interviewed and, pre and, the, and the cases were prepared here in these buildings right here. This is where the trial was held next door. There was a bill this is the courtroom. This is the prison where the prisoners were held. This is the, this is the building next door where the courtroom, the, where the shades are pulled, that's the, that's the courtroom where the picture was taken. And that's where we met. Notice the military vehicles that are out there. This is a picture that was taken early during the first trials. The first trials were of the major leadership of Germany was over by the time we got there. They finished up in July of 46. But I showed this picture to show you the witness box where the witnesses and uh, the, the defendants were, were held and during the court. Notice the MPs behind them. Now, what most, this was all paneling across here. What most people don't know is that this one was a door. And when you open that door, there was a, a metal, round metal sir, uh, staircase leading down into the basement of the building, which then connected to a tunnel. And that tunnel led back to the prison so that there would be no possibility of escape.
my ride home. Went, came back on the same ship that we went over on. Uh, it's a really a major change in the ships. As I said, it was still a troop transport when we went over. Almost three years later when we came back, it, we had cabins. It was really a major change in, 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 in lifestyle for us. <coughs> the Statue of Liberty is probably one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen, particularly when you've been out of country for a period of time. We all got up early the morning that we were to dock and had breakfast and hurried up on deck. And we waited probably an hour, hour and a half before we were able to, actually the fog lifted and we were able to see the Statue of Liberty. And it's the greatest thing that you ever saw to welcome you back to the country as it has welcomed so many people as we come in to this land. And you know, we are a nation of immigrants. Almost all of us, the very few of us are original to this country, we're, uh, we're all products of, of immigrants. And uh, I think it behooves us to be aware of that and uh, consider those in need in the current world that we live in. I thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. Are there any questions that you would like to ask? One of the things I do li would like to share with you is that first basketball trip that we had. First year I was in uh, there, 1946-47. Uh, we went to Frankfurt to play a basketball game. And uh, after the game was over and the next day we were getting ready to head back to, to, to home, to Erlangen, the... Uh, there was a large group of us there. Half of them decided that they wanted to go visit Heidelberg, which is a beautiful city on the, uh, to, and a university city. And the rest of us had to go return home. So I was supposed to go be with the group going back home, but somehow or another, I still don't know quite how, I ended up with the Heidelberg group. Well, when I realized that I was with the wrong group, I told the, uh, the coach and he, Jumped and grabbed a jeep and rushed me to the train station to be with the group that was returning home. And I ran out on the platform just to watch the train disappear down the track. I ran back out. The coach was gone. He had gone back to get with the other group going to Heidelberg. And I'm stranded in a strange country <laughs> in the station and I don't know the language. <laughs> uh, well, fortunately, you know, GI, American GIs are some of the greatest people in the world. There was a young, one young man, and, and you know, I, st I don't remember his name, but he took pity on me, he saw me, and he came up and he introduced me, himself to me and wanted to know what was, what was wrong, and I told him what had happened. He said, well, let's go over to the ticket counter and see what we can find out. He escorted me over to the uh, ticket counter and we found out that the next train to Bamberg and Nuremberg wasn't until eight o'clock that night. So I had the whole day, this is nine o'clock in the morning, I have, to, I have the whole day to wait for the next train. So he, he kind of takes me under his wing and keeps me company for, the, for that morning. And then at noon, we go across, there's a big square in the center of uh, Frankfurt and out in, uh, across, uh, uh, the Frankfurt rain, uh, train station, the Bahnhof. And across the way is a PX uh, hamburger spot. So he takes me over there and buys me a hamburger and some french fries and a, and a milkshake and then escorts me back to the train station and he goes and visits with his friends and I take a nap on one of the benches and then train time he makes sure that I get on the train find a seat and then he goes and joins his buddy and later I find out that he's in a poker game you know but he's made sure that I'm on that train 
and uh, and finally I go to sleep, and when I wake up and go to look for him again, he's already departed the train and gone. So I I finally got on, was able to get into to uh, to Nuremberg and then transfer for the train into Bamberg. But you know, thank God for guys like that in the American service. And that was one of the things one of the people in the last class asked, you know, what was the German population response to the American occupation? I think in many ways it was surprise. You know, what they had been used to in terms of military people was nothing like what they saw in the American GI. And it was an altogether new experience. I'm truly amazed that the current Chancellor of Germany grew up in East Germany, you know, and she lived under the restrictions and the, the, the horrible life conditions that were there. And when Germany was united, uh, she remembers her history. She remembers the history of Germany. And Germany today is taking more refugees from the Near East than any other nation. I think it's truly amazing that Germany is remembering her history and it behooves us to remember ours as well. Thank you so much.